Thank you for joining us at Church Experience Online. If you would like to learn more, get connected, or help fuel the movement by giving, just click on the appropriate links on the website. Well, I think Major Laser had it right. We all need somebody to lean on, right? Now, when we do, we all need somebody to lean on because here's the reality and the truth under the song is that we're all fragile in many ways. We all can lose our footing from time to time, and we need somebody to lean on. Well, if you want to have somebody to lean on in your life, you need to be the kind of person that others can lean on. So what does that look like? Well, in the handout we gave you, we call it the weekly, as you now know, uh, if you flip that over, you can find some notes on the back, and, and maybe you'd want to write this down. Others can lean on you when you're leaning on God. Others can lean on you when you're leaning on God. See, we think that God is the most important and the strongest foundation in life, and it's so important that he is the foundation of your life because there's nothing else that you can lean on that has the strength and the solidarity and the, and the might to uphold you when the pressures of life come crushing in onto your life. You know, the stronger you are, the more weight you can carry. And as you lean on God, you become stronger because you're leaning on something that's stronger than anything you're gonna come against. This is why God has to be the foundation of our lives. You can put the full weight of whatever it is that you're going through right now on God. I'm fully aware of the fact that many of you come in here today and you have some stuff that's, that's leaning on you. You have some weight that's leaning on you. And it might be the weight of someone else, maybe a loved one, and they're going through something and that's creating a lot of pressure in your life. Perhaps it's a career situation, a financial situation, some other relationship deal or, or conflict or hardship or lack of or need. And I know that you come and you have those issues. And you come to the right place because when we bring our issues to God, he is able to carry us and we're able to lean on him and let him be our strength. I love how God addresses the heart of our needs uh, through his word, the Bible. And we're going to look at quite a few scriptures today from the Bible uh, that, that talk about specifically that leaning on the faithfulness of God. Because he's faithful for us no matter what we go through. And I love Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to put the verses on the screen for you. But Isaiah 40, the, the chapter closes out this way. It, st it starts with a question. It says, do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. I love this. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The Lord is the everlasting God. He's all powerful. He's the creator. He created you and I. And it says here, it says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. When we hope in the Lord, when our hope is in him, what's in the foundation of God, when we lean on him, we will renew our strength because God's strength is infinite. It's limitless. It's unending. And so as you and I lean on God, as we press into our relationship with him, he strengthens us. Our faith is renewed. You know, people are not always dependable. It says even youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. You know, those who we think have infinite strength don't. I mean, we, we trip up in life. We lose our footing from time to time. I know what it's like to lose your footing. I grew up uh, a lot of my years in Michigan, and uh, starting this time of year and on, you never know. I mean, it can snow at any point, and it can get icy, it can get cold, and you're always having to worry about slipping and falling and this kind of thing. And so if you don't know what I'm talking about, you've lived in Florida your whole life, perhaps. Uh, this, this is what I'm talking about, what it means to lose your, your footing. Check it out. <laughs> You know, I grew up in that. I grew up in that. And, and I, know what I, I don't know what it means to lose your footing. And then Isaiah tells us that, you know, we stumble and fall from time to time. And you, you might lose your footing. And some of us, you come in here like that, and you, you feel like your life's wobbly like that. And you're like, man, things are about to just to blow up and fall apart. And, and I feel like that, that, the last guy, I mean, that was a little ridiculous. But that's how I feel. 
And that's not uncommon to us in our humanity is that, that things start to rattle and fall apart. We lose our footing, you know. Maybe we make some bad choices. Maybe someone else makes some bad choices that's inflicted upon us. But we so easily, as it says in Isaiah 40, we can stumble and fall. We can lose our footing. And it hurts when we fall. I've fallen on ice. I've hit my head on the ice. I know it's no fun. And when we fall, sometimes we are hurt. And, and sometimes it hurts deep inside and no one else can see it. There's no blood and scars on the outside, but the scars run deep on the inside. And by leaning on God's strength that says we can renew our hope, renew our strength, God renews us, he heals us, he restores us. And so if you are weary from running the race of life, there's no better place to run than to run to God. You know, working out your faith in daily life, it it strengthens you. As you lean into God and lean on God in these difficult times, the more you do it, the more often you practice that, the greater your faith becomes and the stronger your uh, spiritual muscle grows. You know, the more that we can be there for others, uh, the more weight that God can put on our shoulders. The stronger we are, the more we lean into him, the more opportunity he can give us. But pressure increases with opportunity. It increases with responsibility. As God gives you more responsibility in your life and others start leaning on you, that increases pressure. And so all the more the need for you to lean on God. And so some of you, you're carrying quite a weight because maybe you're the, maybe one of the, the leaders of your family and maybe you got some young children looking up to you. Or maybe you got some friends that are looking to you for advice. Or, or maybe you have an elderly parent that you're caring for. Or maybe at work you have management responsibilities. And on and on the list goes. But you have others leaning on you. And the more they lean on you, the more important it is for you to lean on God. Because the greater the responsibility, the greater the pressure. And the greater the pressure, the greater the need for you to lean on God. Because the greater the opportunity for you to stumble and fall. For those of you who are serving those of you who are in ministry, you're making a difference with your life. Others are leaning on you in some way. I want, I want to read a verse specifically uh, for you in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It says stand firm. So don't don't lose your footing. Stand firm, stand strong, let nothing move you. And you're going to come across things that push and pull on you, and it's going to be real easy to lose your footing. And so it says stand firm. Those of you who are serving, you're leading, you're making a difference in people's lives, stand firm in that. Keep doing it because you know that what you're doing is not in vain. It makes a difference. It's important. And when people are leaning on you, it's very important that you don't stumble and fall. Now it's going to happen, but it's very important that you do your best to stand firm and stand strong. So how do you do that? How do you do that when the pressure's on, when the weight is on in your life? How do you do that? You lean on God. You lean on his strength. You you stand steadfast and and faithfully lean on him. You know, we like to escape, I, I think, to the extremes. When the pressure's on, you and I, we like to escape to the extremes. Instead of leaning on and following through and being faithful and finishing, you know, we, we drift off into something easier, better, new, different, because that's a lot easier than faithfully leaning on and pressing on and pressing through hardship. A lot of us have a lot of half-finished projects, interrupted relationships. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the college student that, that maybe never graduates because they switch majors like five different times and then they run out of money. Do you remember like the classic Tommy Boy movie? You know, it's like, Tommy, you've been in school for seven years. He's like, yeah, a lot of people do that. Well, Tommy, yeah, they're called doctors. (laughs) You know, it's like, you know, know, it's, it's real easy to get distracted and forget and lose sight of what the end goal is and to lose direction. In Isaiah 40 that we just read a few moments ago, it says that, that no one can really fathom God's understanding. We can't. We just can't even fathom the understanding of God and how, how wise and knowledgeable he is, how great he is. We just, we're not even on that level. We can't under, even understand it. So it's really important for us to know that there is a God in heaven who has greater understanding than us, greater knowledge and greater wisdom, so that when we come to a place where we don't know what to do, is that we, instead of running or running to other things to fix and solve the problems, that we run first to God, that we lean on his wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? I've been, like probably several of you, we have a Bible reading plan that we're kind of reading through here, and 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 I've been, uh, one of the books I've been reading through right now is is Job. And in Job chapter 28, it asks this question, where does wisdom come from? Verse 20, where where does it dwell? And it goes on, it says it's hidden from the eyes of every living thing. And if you jump down in this 
this passage, it says, God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. So God knows where wisdom is. You know, he, it says, for he views the ends of the earth, and he sees everything under the heavens. You know, so where does, where does wisdom dwell? Well, it's not on the internet. You know, I, I know that a lot of us, we have a problem, we Google it, right? Well, I hope that you would go to God before you would go to Google when you have a problem, Right? You know, but our, our response is like, hey, let me pull up my phone, or let me call up a friend, and like, and that, that's all fine, and then there's some great things there, but man, go first to God when you have a problem. Lean on Him, because God's wisdom, which you tap into through prayer and through your personal relationship with Him, God's wisdom is infinite. It's limitless. It's unending. And so lean on Him. In fact, I love James chapter 1. Just the clarity of the Bible sometimes is just, it's just so potent. And in James chapter 1, verse 5, it just says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, okay, yes, God. Okay, that's me speaking right to me. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. This is if you lack wisdom. And man, I've prayed that prayer so many times. God, I don't have wisdom in this situation. You know what to do. God, give me wisdom. Give me discernment. And it says that he gives generously. You tap into God through prayer and you say, God, you know, I'm leaning on you right now, God, because I just don't know what to do. I'm in over my head. I'm beyond, God, I'm, I'm beyond myself and I need your help. I'm leaning into you now, God. Give me wisdom. Give me strength. And it says that he gives generously because he loves you. Of course he would. As a child of his, he, he wants to care for you and help you. The problem is that sometimes we don't lean on him. We lean on other things to support us. We lean on other things to carry us, and sometimes not even good things. And we run to all sorts of things to help instead of running to the one who can really help us. So we do need to lean on God for wisdom, but that's not it. The Bible says that we also should lean on others, especially other Christian believers, other followers of Jesus, people who believe in this Jesus, and they follow him, lean on them and get their advice. So get wisdom from God and get advice from others. You see this throughout the Bible. You know, I think we make really big decisions way too fast. I think just in our culture, I think we make huge decisions way too fast. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, we, we, make, we make just split-second decisions that have long-term consequences. In, in, in emotion, sometimes in the, in the heat of emotion, we make decisions that have lasting and permanent consequences. You know, if you've ever locked yourself out of your car, I mean, you know what that's like to you just in a hurry and, and you run and you get out and you lock the doors and all of a sudden you left the keys inside and it's locked. And, you know, we just do things so fast sometimes especially in decision making. Proverbs chapter 15, which God gave us specifically for the purpose of passing on wisdom. And if you're saying, I really need some of this wisdom, how do I access it? Well, read, read the book of Proverbs. But Proverbs 15 verse 22, it says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. So lean on the advice of others. Lean on the wisdom of others, especially godly people in your life. Access their wisdom. Because there's, I guarantee it, people in your life who have experienced both sides of the decision that you're about to make. You have some big decision in your life. There's someone who did this, and they went that way, and they know what that resulted in. And there's someone who went this way, and they know what that resulted in. And they're going to give you some stories, and those stories can help inform your decision making. And maybe keep you from making some mistakes that later on you'll wish you had not have made. You can learn from others' mistakes which is much wiser than having to make the mistakes on your own and learn from them. However, as obvious as this may sound, you and I, a lot of times, don't go lean on others for advice because the truth of the matter, a lot of times, is we want to do what we want to do. You know, we get an idea in our head and we're like, no, I'm, I'm going to do this. And, and it's a bit of pride in there. and We, we want to do what we want to do when we want to do it and how we want to do it. And even if we know the right answer is not what we want to do, we still kind of want to push our way through and say, no, this round peg square hole, it's still going to work. Like, I'm, I'm going to make this work because this is what I want to do. And sometimes we don't go ask advice because we've not humbled ourselves to want to know what the other person really says. And it's not even that we feel that we have or are compelled to do what they say. It's just we don't even really necessarily want to hear the other side because it's kind of we know in the back of our mind that that might be the wise thing to do. We just don't really want to do that. So we don't lean on the advice of others. And the Bible tells us that better decisions are made when you lean on the counsel of others. 
So you lean on the wisdom of God and you lean on the counsel of godly believers around you, which is one of the reasons why it's so important to be connected in a church and not even just attending a service. I mean, the 13 different life groups going now and I, I think the first week they had over 170 people that were connected in these different groups meeting all throughout the area and they're, they're, they're tapping into godly relationships that are gonna bear fruit in their life as they connect to other people. So do you have a decision? Do you have a prayer in your life that you wanna seek advice about? from someone? Is there something that your heart's crying out about and you don't know where to turn? Turn to God. Turn to godly believers around you. Next in your notes, if you're writing these things down, is that faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. Faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. Faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. Man, I just wish I could just say that like a hundred times and that would just be ingrained just through the words that would just sink down in our soul. But I know that just the words won't do it alone. It's, it's something that we have to on our own seek out in God and, and find it true. But it's, it's such a reality that faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. And your legacy comes for how, from how well you lean on and how well you press on. But the Bible tells us that faithfulness is, is something that's, that's more rare. It's unfortunately not as common. Again, in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, it tells us this. Many claim to have unfailing love, but a faithful person, who can find? A faithful person, who can find? You know, many, many claim that they are faithful. Many claim that they're consistent and they follow through, and, but they're few and far between. Even King David prayed this in, in Psalm chapter 12, verse 1. He says, help, Lord, for no one is faithful anymore. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. And this is his heart just praying to God and crying out. He probably looks around him and doesn't see any any faithful. And he says, God, I don't think there's any left in the human race. You know, I don't think anyone's faithful. And and, and you know this by experience, right? I mean, the the faithfulness is not common to us. And it's, it's more common for us to be unfaithful. But faithfulness is what produces fruitfulness in our lives when we faithfully lean on God and we lean on the right decisions and we, and we, we turn those decisions over and over again and we make those right decisions and we come to the fork in the road and we want to go right but we know we need to go left and we go left and time and time again we make that right choice and God honors that and that faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. But it's hard to be faithful. <laughs> I know this from experience. <laughs> I know that it's hard to be faithful. Jennifer and I got together at the age of well, we met at the age of 18, got together at the age of 19, so we've, we've known each other for 16 years now. And uh, man, I, I remember first meeting her and how deeply and quickly I fell in love with her and, and just how, how much I knew that like she was the one. And so when we were separated for a summer, she went home, we were college students, she went home to be with her parents in California. I went and worked a job in the Midwest, so we're dating, but we couldn't be together. So it's a college summer break, four months. It felt like an eternity. So right before she left, you know, a little young lover boy that I was trying to be, I went out to the store and I brought this, this binder that you would have like at school and I filled it with all these plastic sleeves and I just, I filled the thing up and, and I went to her right before she got on her airplane to fly out to California. I said, all right, baby, I love you so much. You know, young love, you know how it is. We're kissing in the airport and all this stuff and, and it's before 9-11 so you like walk into the gate and like, I'm, I miss you, baby. You know, just like kissing her right before she goes through and, and it's like this and I got something for you and, and inside this binder was like, probably like 50 or 90, whatever it was, like different plastic sleeves. I'm like, I'm gonna write you a letter every single day. And this book right here, this is so you can put all those letters in here and you can have them forever. I'm going to write you a letter every single day of the summer. You know, big promise as a 19-year-old young guy, right? Well, she goes off and we're talking on the phone every day, of course, and all this stuff. I write her a couple letters. And you want to guess how many letters I wrote her by the end of the summer? It's embarrassing. Three. I wrote her three letters. <laughs> That's one a month, man. That's bad. That's not even one a month. That's horrible. You know, it's hard to be faithful. It's it's easy to make promises. It's easy to make commitments. It's easy to talk a big game. But when it comes to following through and being faithful, man, I know what that's like. You know, Isaiah 40 told us, young men stumble and fall. The youth grow tired and weary. Our energy, our our strength to, to press through on commitment sometimes can falter and sometimes can fail. But when you're faithful, it leads to fruitfulness. When you're faithful, it leads to fruitfulness. And God is somebody that you and I can lean on because because he is faithful. Because he's dependable. Because God always comes through on his promises. There's no promise. You cannot find a time when God promised something and he did not come through it. He is always faithful. Every time in his promise, he's always faithful. And you know, I don't, I don't need to probably go to this length, but I want to show you because I, I know that, that some of us were like, really, I mean, is that, is that true? I mean, yes, it is. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. 
Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is a what? He's a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. It's Old Testament. Going to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. You wanted us to know it, so it's all throughout the Bible. It says, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is what? He's faithful. He's faithful. He who called us in, into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, when we catch a glimpse of God's faithfulness, it spurs on our faithfulness. When we see his, his consistency and his dependability. I really like uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is, would everybody say it with me? He is faithful. He's faithful. And he's not going to let you down. Other people are going to let you down. All of us are flawed. We're human. You're going to let somebody down. We, all, we let each other down. We, we stumble. We lose our footing. We make mistakes. We don't see things clearly. We stumble and fall. But it says those who hope in the Lord, in Isaiah 40, those who hope in the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will get greater strength as they lean on the foundation of, that is our Father in heaven, God. And, you know, one of the greatest ways to lean on that foundation is through reading the Bible daily. And I think if we could put this link up here, that'd be great. It's on our website. We have a, a daily Bible reading plan. I've challenged you guys with this before. It's not the first time. But I just think there's very few things that are going to bring more life into your daily life than reading the Bible every single day. You, you'll hear it many times, but there's few I've found that actually take hold of this and do it. But those who actually do it over a long period of time, man, it, their lives are different. It's like someone pumping... Uh, weight reps, you know, you don't see the difference in a few weeks, but man, in a few months, it's game changing. It's, it's totally a different ball game. And, and I just want to challenge you to take hold of this. You can access it um, and just, just read on a daily basis and, and, and press into the faithful, faithfulness of God. Let's go on. In your notes. I learned this some time ago, and it, it, when I first heard it, it just made such an impact in my life. A, a good friend, uh, another pastor, a guy I look up to so much, share this with me, and, and uh, man, it's just made an impact in my life. Commit and complete. Maybe you want to write that down. Commit and complete. Commit and complete. In your career and marriage and your faith and serving others, doing the right things, whatever your race is that you're running, commit to it when you know it's something that's honoring to God and complete it. Commit and complete. You know, sometimes I think we get discouraged. We like to give up, whether it's hard times, physical suffering, broken relationships, high stress, busyness, financial pressure, sin, addiction, broken relationships with God. So what we do is we quit. We quit. We give up on a good thing. We lower our standards. We compromise. We settle for less. We slip into bad patterns. These things happen when you and I come across things that are hard. We tend to quit. You know, in high school, I, I played basketball all the way through, and, and, and I love basketball, still do. And, and I remember one particular game where we had high hopes of winning this particular game, but we lost. And we lost pretty good, and the team was discouraged. So we go in the locker room, and you, you know high school sports are like, and all the emotion and the drama attached to it with the guys that were feeling that. And, and so we get in the locker room, and, and, and guys are just so upset about this loss. They're like kicking the lockers. They're throwing towels. Everyone's just down because they'd hoped to win, but we lost. And so everyone's hope was gone. And, and we had such high hopes for this season. And our coach comes into the locker room a few minutes later, and he kind of assesses, I imagine, the situation in his mind, and he keeps his composure, and he calls everybody together. He said, guys, I want you to sit down for a minute. Why don't you look up here at me? He said, I, he said I, know, I know we just had a difficult loss. He said, but I don't want you, and I'll never forget these words. I still remember in high school. He, he said, I don't want you to give up on me because I'm not going to give up on you. He said, don't give up on me because I'm not going to give up on you. And, and some of you are ready to give up because you're, you're going through hard right now. You're going through difficult. And, 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 you're, and, you're, and you're scratching a claw and trying to find a way to get through it on your own and it's not working. And I'm just saying lean on God and don't give up. Lean on the faithfulness of God and know that he's going to be faithful to see you through it. Think about sports. How different would sports history be if every team that was behind gave up when they were losing? I mean, how many amazing comeback stories were there? And, and how different would it be if teams gave up when they were behind? Check this out. Manning back again. He looks, he fires, touchdown Kevin Moss. And that should wrap it up. The Giants, 31. The Eagles, 10. With 8-17 left in the game, the Giants held a seemingly insurmountable 21-point lead. Pick takes the snap. He's looking. He floats it. 
Good. Running with the football of Selleck. Touchdown! Akers to kick off. It's an onside kick. Covered by Riley Cooper. Oh, yeah! Ball Thanks. comes back to Vic. Here comes the rush. He tucks under a man and he's going to run. 40, 35, 30, 25, 20. Back at the 10. Done down at the 6. Oh, my goodness, the Eagles are alive. Just under six minutes to play. Third down, it goes to Vic. Quarterback draw, he's in! It is now Giants, 31. Eagles, 24. He's back, he looks, he fires, complete. And Macklin sidestepped and runs in for the touchdown! This is unbelievable. We are tied at 31. On New York's final possession, Philadelphia's defense held forcing the Giants to punt with just 14 seconds remaining. Down he goes! And the Giants will have to punt. We have seen our share of miracles in Eagles-Giants game. The punt is Matt Dodge. The Eagles are going to have Deshaun Jackson back, of course. It's a Duckler. Jackson takes it at the 35, fumbles it, picks it up, looks for running room. He's at the 40. He's at the 45. Oh! He's going to go! Deshaun Jackson! Oh! Seen. They're all enjoying the moment. I love y'all. I love it. I lost my helmet. I don't care. The Eagles' 38-31 victory over the Giants will go down as one of the greatest comeback wins in NFL history. How about those birds? Wow. How different would things be if everyone who was behind gave up? Because they thought, man, there's no way that this is going to work out and get any better, improve. There's no way I can win. I'm so far behind. I know it's the right thing. And how many have given up when victory was just around the corner? How many people have let go when they should have held on? How many have faded back when they should have leaned on? And what do we lean on when it gets hard? We lean on God. And we trust that he has a plan when we're following him, when we're pressing into him, and we're trusting him. And and I just, I love James so much because of the wisdom that God again gives. And, it, and it, it's just so clear here in James chapter 1, verse 2. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials, so when you're down, <laughs> when you're down but not out, when you're on the right path but it gets hard, when it gets difficult, you're doing the right things. And maybe there's a single mom in here who's trying so hard and she's got this kid she's trying to raise and she knows it's a worthwhile endeavor, but she does not feel like she can do it any longer and she's working hard at home, working hard at the job. She's, there's no time for herself. I mean, she's just doing everything she can. And, and, and a million other situations like that that you're in and the people that you love are in, and there's, it's hard, and you're doing the right things, but it's hard. It says, consider it pure joy. I don't understand why, but it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, and they will come. Verse 3, because, why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And that's where it goes on and tells us to ask for wisdom when we need it. It's the verse that we read earlier follow, right, directly follows that. Ask the Lord for wisdom. Lean into him. Press through the hardship because you know that faithfulness leads, as you wrote down, fruitfulness. It leads to fruitfulness. You know, what do, what do we call kids who always have it easy? What do we call kids who have everything that they want and need and it's all given to them without any, you know, effort on their part? where they're completely undisciplined and never, you know, told no. I mean, what do, you, what do people usually call those kids? They call them spoiled brats or worse, right? I mean, the, the kid that, that just is, is not disciplined, the, the, the parents, I mean, and, and here's, the, here's the principle I, I kind of can see in that is that, that only having a soft road under your feet can make you a soft person. Not having any trials can make you a soft person, but Having a tough road can make you strong. See, God's in need of warriors, not wimps. <laughs> See, God, God wants warriors, and he needs those who know what it's like to press through hardship. Is it easy to be faithful? No. Is it, is it easy to press on and lean on through difficulty? No. But is it worthwhile, and is it crucial? I mean, it absolutely is. You know, 
Martin Luther King Jr. said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands at times of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. See, that's how you measure character. It's, it's when, when it's difficult, not in the easy times. It's in the challenging times. It's in times of hardship. That's where character is tested. When you hit the dirt road, it's when it's tested. We learn to be faithful. We learn to say yes to God's way. In fact, maybe there's someone here who are going through times of temptation, and you just feel so sucked into it, and it's hard for you to stand up under it, and you just feel like, man, I just don't know how I can press through this. I want to share some encouraging words with you, hopefully in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. You feel alone and that no one understands your battle, but there are, trust me, there are others who understand, maybe not your exact scenario, but they know what it's like to be really lured into something and pulled towards something that's not good for them, that pulls them off center. And just that, they feel that, the weight of that, the pressure of that. It says, so no temptation is overtaking you except what's common to mankind, but it goes on, verse 13 here, and God is faithful. There it is again. It's all over the place. God is faithful. He's faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So you can know a couple things. You can know that whatever it is that you're going through, this is common in our humanity, that you and I are not immune to what others before us have had to go through. Yet at the same time, not only is it common to us, is that God understands he's there with us in it, and he's faithful through it, and he says that whatever you're facing, it will not be greater than the weight that you can carry as long as you're leaning on him. Now you go alone, you're on your own. But with God, we're told that no temptation has seized us except for what is common to man and God's faithful. He'll not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. And not only that, he will provide a way out so that we can endure it, so that we can remain faithful. Another aspect of God's faithfulness, not only is he faithful to help us through sin and temptation, but he's faithful to punish us when we sin. Now, he doesn't give us the full weight of what our sin deserves gratefully because of his mercy. He doesn't always give us what we deserve, you know, but there's, there's still punishment for our sin and it's correction. The Bible calls it discipline. God disciplines us because we're legitimate children of his, because he loves us. And so when we step off center and, and we experience consequences, we're like, God, what happened? He's like, well, I told you that I kind of gave you the path and you kind of did your own thing. And so then you got into this mess. And, and, you know, if I saved you from every single mess, you'd be that spoiled child that just got everything, even though they never made the right choices. And that would ruin you. And I love you too much to ruin you with a soft road. And when you make bad choices, sometimes I allow consequences, not of my doing, but of your own. But I don't quickly pull you out of every situation and hardship that you find yourself in. Because if you never learn that lesson, then I'm giving you the soft road that will erode your soul. But gratefully, and man, this is, I think, the best part of this message today and what we're going to end on is this. God's faithfulness, it extends into our messes that we make. And if you're writing these things down, God is faithful to forgive Man, isn't that awesome? God's faithful to forgive. I mean, you can lean on God so much even in the midst of your mess that, that he's faithful to forgive. And I don't know what mess you may find yourself in here and maybe what issues might be going on in your life, but you can know that God's faithful to forgive. And when we acknowledge and ask for forgiveness, it doesn't matter how far off God may seem. It really is truly only one step back to him and saying, God, please forgive me. God, I want to lean into you and live for you. I acknowledge you and I ask for your forgiveness. I humble myself before you. You don't have to fix the mess before you come to God. That's an illusion that you'll never get to. It's like, I'm going to fix my life. I'm going to clean up my life. I'm going to get things together. And then I'm going to come to God and present myself, say, God, man, I made it, but I'm ready now. I'm fit. And, and, and it's like, we're never there. I mean, our, our best days, <laughs> the Bible tells, tells us like this in Isaiah, our righteousness you know, on our own, our righteous deeds, our goodness is like filthy rags. It really, it just doesn't compare to the holiness and the amazingness of God. It just, it doesn't measure up. So, so don't try to get yourself in a position where you think, okay, now I'm worthy and now it's okay for me to come and, and now it's okay to, for me to, 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 to follow God and to live for him and to stand up for him. No, it's, that day is never going to happen on your own because we, you and I cannot fix the messes on our own. We come to God with the mess. We say, God, here I am, and, and I know that you love me in the midst of my mess, and this is kind of embarrassing to come, and it's, and it's a little bit shameful, but God, I know I don't have to be. I can come confidently as you say in your word because I know you love me, and you accept me as your child as I come and confess, acknowledge my sin to you, and I, and I receive you in my life. And this is true for others, too, and leaning on others. You don't have to get your life right and make it look like it's all right on the outside because here's the, here's the reality. All of us got stuff going on under the surface that's hard to deal with from time to time. We all make mistakes from time to time. 
We all have hardships, temptations, struggles, challenges. And the person sitting next to you and the person in front of you and behind you is going through in different ways their own battles, their own storms, their own mountains they're trying to climb. That's what connects us in our humanity. And so it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be real. In fact, that's the best way to live life is just be real and be like, here's what's going on. Here's what's going on. And just share that and lean on each other. And you know what? Don't fix yourself and then go, I mean, go with the mess and let them help you fix it. Acknowledge it. Confession, admitting our issues leads to healing, as it says in the Bible. God's faithful to forgive. He's incredibly faithful. Even when you and I are unfaithful, you're saying, Man, how, could God, how could God forgive me, Brandon? I mean, if we could just sit down, I could tell you my story. I mean, you don't know, I mean, the things I've done. I mean, I mean, it was a big deal for me just to come. I'm wait, waiting for the lightning bolts to drop as I walk through the door. <laughs> it's like, you just don't know. And I don't need to know because, you know, God already knows. And you know what? He loved you so much. It says in the Bible, God so loved the world and the world that was lost in sin that he gave his only son. He gave up which it was most valuable to him, his son. He gave to die on a cross 2,000 years ago for your sin and for mine. He loved you that much. He's faithful to forgive, even when you and I are unfaithful. Romans 5, while we were still in our sin, he gave his son to forgive us of our sins. He's that faithful. He's that good. And you're like, it can't be that good. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, it can't, it, but it is. And he, it's because he's that good. He's that faithful. You're like, but I've been so unfaithful. I get it. But he is so faithful. Man, I've made so many messes, but listen, the, the message through the, the mess is this, is that Jesus loves you despite the messes you've made. And he wants to help you through them. He doesn't want you to try to get through it alone. But you've got to be faithful to lean into him and trust in him. Acknowledge him because he's faithful to forgive. You know, it says it so clearly in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. There it is again. He's faithful and just. Will forgive us our sins. Purify us from all unrighteousness. You know, God's so faithful. He's so faithful. You know, a verse that... I've held on to you for quite a few years, and I, I love it. It's John chapter 1, verse 12. It says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. To those who, who believed in him. And God, I believe in you. I don't understand it all, but I believe in you. And, and Jesus, your son, he, he died for me. You know, he did. He sent his own son to die for you. And maybe you've heard that before, been familiar with that, maybe not. And it's, it's one of those things that's just been kind of at a distance, and it's like it's personal. It's for you. He, he, he's faithful to forgive you. Not the person next to you, them too, but this is for you. And, and he said, I'm faithful to forgive, but you have to come and believe. Believe in Jesus, the Son of God who came. He walked this earth, and he was the only one that could have died in our place. You know, you and I had this, this debt we had amounted. You know, it's like to be maybe in debt. Well, man, our debt was so high it could never be repaid. It was our sin debt, and the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. Spiritual death as well, separation from God forever. And, and you and I just, we were bankrupt. There was nothing we could do. We were helpless. And we'd be forever separated from God. But, but God says, I, I don't want you to be forever separated because I love you. I created you. I want you to be in relationship with me. And I want you to come into paradise with me forever. And so I'm going to send my son Jesus to die on a cross for your sins. And all you need to do is believe. As it says here in John chapter 1, verse 12, receive him into your life. That God, please forgive me of my sin. And see, Jesus, he, he died for your sin. He, again, he was the only one that could have because he was the only one that walked this earth that was without sin. The Son of God came, he lived, he died, and he died for you. And he's, they killed him because of what he believed and what he taught and how he lived. But he, as he died on the cross, he was even faithful to forgive those who were persecuting him. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was faithful to forgive even those who killed him. And he's faithful to forgive us as we lean in to our relationship with him. And perhaps that's a step that some of you would like to make today, or maybe you need to come back to him and say, man, I've, just, I've wandered away, and it, today is my day. You know, I came for that reason. I need to lean into God. I'm going to give you an opportunity as we close in prayer here to lean into him. But my hope is that all of us will lean on the faithfulness of God. Right on? Come on, if you would, let's close our eyes and pray together. God, you're so faithful, and you've been so kind to us. You've been so loving toward us that no matter the many ways that we've wandered away, you've always, you've always drawn us in. And I just thank you so much for your love that does draw us in. And I thank you for your, for your forgiveness. You're so faithful to forgive. And God, as we lean on you in a relationship with you, I pray that you would give us endurance and faithfulness to commit and complete and to be faithful and find, find that the fruitfulness comes from that faithfulness and that we would just see you at work in our lives as we submit our lives to you. 
And God, in this moment as we pray, perhaps there's some who are hearing this prayer and they know that, that they have been leaning on other things, other people, but they've never really tried to lean on you with their life. They've, they've gone down many roads, but it's never been the road that leads to you. And they've realized that a lot of those roads that they've been on, they've, they've got to the end of them and they're dead end roads and they've never come to the, to the place where they've, they've rested in you. And they're weary. Young men stumble and fall, it tells us, and they're, they're weary and they've slipped, they've lost their footing and they're looking for a solid foundation to stand on. And perhaps there's someone here today who are there and they're saying, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to, to believe in him and receive him into my life, ask for God's forgiveness. I don't understand it all yet. I maybe have some doubts still, have some questions, but, but God, help me in my unbelief. Help me as I grow and as I learn to lean on you, what that looks like. And if that's you as we're praying together, uh, you can receive Jesus into your life simply just by praying that honest and genuine prayer of just admitting your mistakes, your sin and receiving Jesus into your life. And so as we're praying here together, let me just pray a simple prayer like that. I'm just basically gonna pray those words. And if you would like to do that, you can repeat those words and you can say them out loud boldly if you'd like to. The person next to you, they're they're gonna be happy for it. But most likely you may just feel comfortable praying it in the silence of your own heart. It doesn't matter either way. As long as it's genuine, God hears you, he knows. And if in your heart you're whispering these words to God and it's genuine, you can know that he receives that and he receives you. And it says he adopts you as his child. It's an incredible moment. It's one step going in a new direction of your life. You're saying, I'm, I'm not going down that road I was on. I'm going down a new road. I follow Jesus. So if that's you with your eyes closed and heads bowed, you can just repeat this prayer after me. God in heaven, I believe in you. And I believe in your son Jesus who died for me to pay the penalty for my sins. And I admit my sins to you. Please be faithful to forgive I receive you into my life and I thank you for your faithfulness. And with eyes closed and heads bowed, if you pray a prayer like that, man, that's awesome. You made that commitment to Jesus, man, that's that's the step you needed to take that's gonna change everything. And I wanna challenge you to really mark this moment you know, put a stake in the ground and say, this, this was that moment. And I want to challenge you to do something bold and just, and, and, and to be bold and not ashamed of this. And I want you just to, you know, with, with others, you know, this is not time for you. This is for those of you who made a commitment. Maybe with eyes closed, heads bowed. Maybe those of you who made that commitment, will you just raise your hand up high in the air and look up at me? Say, yeah, that was me today. Right on. That's awesome. Very cool. Right on. Right on. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else say, yeah, that was me today. I made that commitment. I'm stepping out. God, you, you see our hearts. You see our commitments. Thank you for your faithfulness for, for, to forgive. Thank you for the way you're at work in our life. I pray, God, that as you continue to work, and I know you've been at work in drawing people close to you for, for these, these weeks, and I know you're gonna continue to come in the coming weeks, but as we go through hardship, may we lean on you and trust your faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Right on. Hey, let's celebrate those who are making steps today to follow Jesus. That's awesome. Come on. We hope you got a lot out of today's teaching. Remember, if you would like to learn more, get connected, or begin to give, click on the appropriate links on the website. We're so glad you stopped by online, and we hope to see you in person soon.